Let us stand as we open up our hymnals again and sing praise to God. Singing hymn number 131, Children of the Heavenly Father. chapter 8, verse 26 through 39. Hear God's word as we look at it together. Then they sailed to the country of the Gardeans, which is opposite of Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore nor clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. And when Jesus saw him, he cried out, fell down before him, and, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demons into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of swine was feeding there on the mountain, so they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he had permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They also, who had seen it, told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. And the whole multitude of the surrounding region uh, uh, of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And he got into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, 
return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you value in this life? We live in a time where only the physical here and now tends to be valued and focused on. That's why now people usually live by what feels good at the moment. And very few take heart. Jesus' words in Matthew 16, of what profit is it if a man, if he, to a man, if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Do you care about your own soul? Your being, your character, that inner part of you that, that God uh, has, has made us to reflect his image? Sadly, when people do not care about their spiritual well-being, the needs of others also eventually go out the window. Because there is a connection between loving God and truly loving our neighbor. A good example of this actually is with an atheist. Well-known atheist called Bertrand Russell who thought Jesus was really not the best or the most virtuous man. And the reason he gave in one of his books was that it disturbed Russell that Jesus would allow a herd of 2,000 pigs to be, to be destroyed. Russell didn't care that one man was saved for an eternity. The sad truth is some can be more concerned with nature than the people whom God has made to bear his image. Is that said of us? Or do we care more about the people who God sent his son to die on the cross in order to redeem from sin and give eternal life to? See, the great thing of this and the joyful aspect of, of this account of, of Dr. Luke for us here it, it, is to show us the value of a soul before a powerful and gracious Savior, Jesus. And we live in a world where it doesn't seem like people care about the spiritual or about their own souls. They don't care about the things of God. And some are even violently opposed to Jesus. In fact, I read again on uh, some comment that the person was making that, that all the problems of the world are by Christians today. In fact, even in Germany, I was reading a German paper yesterday too, and the German paper, it was the, the German Evangelical Lutheran Church that said that, that Bible believers were more dangerous than Islamicists. The world's being turned upside down. There's so many who have been taken over by their sin and blinded by, by the prince of this age. They don't care. They don't even see the physical and the spiritual destruction that they're running to, both in this life and the next. But here we have this encouragement before us that Jesus, we have a Savior who has the power to transform lives. Jesus, after exercising his almighty power over the winds and the waves, now arrives on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in a Gentile area. And verse 32 shows us that that was the case because they were pig farming. And salted pork uh, was a staple in the diet of the Roman soldiers. But according to God's law in Leviticus 11.7 and other places, pigs were unclean for the Jews. God wanted his people to be different, to look different, and even, even eat differently. And while the dietary laws don't, don't apply to us today, we are called to be different than the world around us. We're called to be holy, because our God is holy. Now it's here that verse 27 tells us that Jesus and his storm-drenched disciples met a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house but in the tombs. Here's a man with a storm inside of himself. He's possessed by many demons. And while the Bible doesn't really talk much about the demons or, or about their origins, we do have a little bit. 
scripture talks about not only did, was Satan, did Satan fall, but he took a third of the heavenly host. He took fallen angels with him. And Luke, being a doctor, did not do as some accuse the ancient world of doing, of saying that uh, uh, every mental struggle or anything like that was, was demon possession. Luke would have known even about the Greek scientist Hippocrates and that uh, illnesses have, also have scientific causes. But there's also demon possession. And we can't forget that in our modern age as well. In fact, the Harvard faculty psychiatrist, Dr. M. Scott Peck, before he died in 2005, acknowledged this in certain case studies. But there are different types of, of demonic-inspired activity. There are things like in Africa with witch doctors, some who I saw from a distance, but a friend of mine's sister who was not a believer was actually murdered by one, by demonic activity in Ghana. Yet more often we can't forget Satan, is, who is like an angel of light, he makes things look good, he seeks whom he may devour, he lies, he blinds people to the truth, and he's a murderer, as Jesus says from the beginning. He tries to destroy God's creation. In fact, the Belgian Confession says the devil and evil spirits are enemies of God and everything good. And we should see that demons act just like their leader. And with this man, his sin somehow had opened the door for many demons. Remember, unrepented sin never leaves a person unaffected. This is why Ephesians 4, 27 says, or warns, do not give the devil a foothold. And the truth is, people who are disobeying God are giving evil spirits a right to work. Not only around them, but in them also. Sin brings suffering, both physically as well as spiritually. Maybe not always right away, but in the end it does. That's why Proverbs 6, 27 through 29, uh, talking about the adulterous woman and man, shows you can't bring fire to your bosom and not get burned. And you think about it even though we live in a world today, too, where we come across people who are possessed uh, by the evil spirits of alcoholism, drugs, and sex, and immorality, and, and, and perversion, and violence, who know they are destroying themselves. They're being ins this is, this is uh, the effect of Satan. And they're destroying themselves, but they don't care. And while the encouragement for the Christian, as James 4, 7 tells us, Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And even as we sang before, the Lord will preserve his people. That doesn't mean we can play with sin. But as the scripture shows, unlike the Holy Spirit, who always sets a man free, develops his personality, increases his self-control and, and dignity. Satanic forces strive or seem to strive to overpower a man's personality and ultimately to break down their self-control and rob them of self-respect. Doesn't that, isn't that what sin does? And with this man, the demonic had taken over. He ran around naked and unwashed and unshaved, was, was uncontrollably evil, and he lived in a graveyard. The parallel passage of Mark even tells us he cut himself with stones and shrieked. You think Satan's not working today? When people don't want to be around any other people, when we were made for communion with each other as believers and with God, when people cut themselves today. Everything about this man was unclean, according to Jewish law. And he was an outcast even to his own Gentile uh, uh, people as well. And you can kind of imagine as they, they step off the boat here that, that the disciples probably scrambled back onto the boat as this madman approached. It's kind of like what I did one time with Zach in Chicago. I locked the doors quick. And we realized we were not in a good area. 
But as this man approached, Jesus stepped out towards him. And right away, the demons acknowledge who Jesus is. Verse 28 tells us, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him. And with a loud voice said, what have I to do with you? Jesus, the son of the most high, I beg you, do not torment me. We live in a world which wants to tell us what has the things of God to do with the things of man, with, with government or with schools. Satan wants to tell us we have nothing, no business to do with the world, and yet the reality is who made this world? Who made it for his glory? Who made you and I to serve him? See, God has everything to do with this world. Christ made this world. He was the creator. And the amazing thing is while we live in an age where, where people sit there and want to deny Christ and, and try to even say, well, you know, Jesus never said he was the son of God and, and things like that. But yet what did these demons say? <laughs> You're the son of the most high. They don't have a problem with that truth. They know who Jesus is and, and what Jesus could do to them. All they could do is beg. And when Jesus asks the man's name, we get an idea of the situation. For the man replies, legion. A Roman legion had 6,000 soldiers and, and many, many, many support troops. So it's possible this man had thousands of demons inside him, ruining his life. And verse 31 then tells us, and they begged him that he, and that's speaking of Jesus, would not command them to go out into the abyss. See, these demons also knew one day Jesus would judge them and cast them into the lake of fire. Demons admitted what modern man wants to deny. Sadly, even pastors like Rob Bell want to deny that there is a God, that there is a hell, a final place of judgment. There is a life to come. Something else this also teaches us, though. The demons even had a lot of knowledge. In fact, Scripture tells us the demons believed and they shudder. True faith is not just knowing certain facts about God or about Jesus. It's trusting and following Christ even in repentance. These demons didn't want that. They just wanted a little more time to carry out their evil plans. Even though they were being overruled by Christ. And so here the demons begged Jesus to let them go into the herd of pigs. This is their request, not his. And he allows them. What happens? The whole herd goes down the hill, and there's all sorts of cliffs in this area, evidently, too. And it goes mad and runs into the water, drowning themselves. And we can't forget, the Bible does tell us that Jesus cares about the sparrows. But Jesus also says that you and I are more important than the sparrows. That's why Jesus didn't come as a bird. This poor soul was more important to Jesus than some pigs. And Jesus also cares about you more than some animal. That's why he shed his blood. That's why he lived the perfect life that we could not. It was not for himself. It was for you and I. So that we could have fellowship with God and not run away from him. Admittedly, this formerly demon-possessed man is immediately transformed. This, this is a picture of, of conversion and, and salvation. And, and it reminds us even and shows us here, this is a great example. And you think about it, there's only, I think, one case of, of this in all the scripture of one man being possessed by so many spirits. And, I mean, this is an absolute desperate situation. No hope. The guys had, had tried to clean up this guy's life. They had bound him even with chains, thinking, well, you know, we'll, we'll help him clean up his life. And yet it's only Jesus that can transform a life. Yeah, 
people can maybe change a little bit of their lives. Jesus will speak about this later in, in Luke eleven twenty four. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And then it returns with others. And the last state is worse than the first. Human solutions to spiritual problems will always fail. Let me say that again. Human solutions to spiritual problems will always fail. Christ is the only one who can transform our lives spiritually. He's the only one that can sanctify us. When you think about this, the spiritual health has a great effect on us physically as well. The Bible shows this man, again, was a rare case of, of mass demon possession. We're not to sit there and think that there's a demon behind uh, or under every pew and under every rock in this world. That's not the way we're to think about it. The catechism talks about it's the devil, the world, and our own flesh that assails us. But we should also see that every time we meet, every time we come across a Christless soul, we have to understand they are dead in their sins and trespasses. They are captive to sin. They can't liberate themselves any more than this man could. We need God to work in our hearts. We need God to work in others' hearts. And Christ, in his plan of salvation, purposely came through that storm, sent his disciples through that storm, and landed on that spot of land. In order to save this man. That's an amazing God. And as John 3 tells us, the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. This is the love of God for lost sinners like this man and like you and I. That should give us hope and encouragement. Encouragement to persevere in serving the Lord. Encouragement to pray for those that are around us that are struggling, or even to pray for your own heart if you're struggling. Sadly, though, some don't care about transformed lives. Briefly, in, in verses 34 through 37, the townspeople were afraid. They asked Jesus to leave. Jesus had shown mercy and love to a man that, 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 that was being destroyed by his sin. A man who didn't deserve mercy. A wonderful picture, and they had seen this wonderful picture of, of a Savior who loves our sin-stained souls, a friend of sinners, but the people didn't care. They didn't care about their friend that was healed. They didn't care about their own eternal welfare. They cared about some pigs that they were going to eat later. If that happened in Jesus' day, since there's nothing new under the sun, it shouldn't surprise us. But if Jesus is hated for helping the spiritual and needy, at times we also will be. But lastly in this text, we see a transformed people. As a transformed people, we must proclaim his transforming grace. Here is a man who is set free. No one expected it. He used to go about naked, living in tombs. And now in verse 35, he's sitting with Jesus, learning from him and clothed in his right mind as one of his disciples. So we have something really surprising here because while Jesus allowed the demons their wishes, this man goes, wants to go with Jesus. And as verse 38 tells us that, yet Jesus tells him in verse 39, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. Notice that again, because Jesus is equating himself with God. He is saying he's God the Son there. He's making it clear. And the reality is, we live in a world that the one who created this world, the one who commands nature still to this day, and has power over all demons, also can command us. If Jesus says go, we better go. If he says stay, we better stay. And this teaches a truth, too, because we have times where, where it may seem like we get an answer to prayer, but it doesn't always mean you're in God's will. The demons got the answer to their request, didn't they? And so also when God says no to us, it's not necessarily a sign of God's disfavor either.
This man was to stay to tell what God, through his son, had done for him. And I know many Christians can wonder, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? God doesn't call everybody to be a pastor. In fact, Paul makes that distinction, even. Men are called to, to spiritually lead. And we can't get lazy about that or be abusive about that. Not all are called to be pastors. Not all are called to be different things. We're, God's given each one of us different talents and different, di different gifts. But we all can tell what God has done for us. In my own life, I walked away from the Lord. And God saved me from the demons of my own making, from my, my walking away from him. But what has God done for you? You need to speak about it to others. To use God's gracious, loving, transforming work in your life. To be a springboard. To, to point other people into God's word. That's why David said, talked about as we read earlier. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way. And sinners will be converted to you. That's our purpose too. This man thought that the best thing to do would be to go with Jesus. But Jesus made him a missionary to his own people. And you can look at one of the parallel passages. Because Mark 7 talks about this later then. And tells us of a time when Jesus would later return to this area. And a crowd of 4,000 people came out to hear their Savior. The only hope of salvation. God's providence, he used this man. I know we can think our words are feeble. I can fumble around. I'm dyslexic. I, I have struggles that way. When I'm tired, it's worse. And I know that even as I preach, but, but we have a Savior who uses us to proclaim his grace. And he uses us in ways that we don't even understand, perhaps even uh, the effects that will be generations later even. We have to proclaim the glories of God's grace, even as Paul did, knowing, as he wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God is pleased in his sovereign plan. As he has set his love on, on many, many different people, even in desperate conditions, God is pleased to use our feeble words about his grace for his glory. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what's the value of a soul? What, what's the value of the people you rub shoulders with? Why does God have you in that place? Even if it may be a very, very difficult place with very, very difficult people. This demoniac was a very difficult person, to say the least. Do you show that you know that God has placed a value on the soul of those around you? Even people you might not expect God has chosen to save? John Wesley, uh, not a reformed man at all, but he's a writer of three of our hymns. He was robbed once, and he told the robber, if you ever do remember this, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's own son, cleanses from all sin. And the robber, after doing that, he, he hurried away then. But year late, years later, a very well-dressed man stepped up to John Wesley to shake his hand. And the man admitted he was that former robber who thanked Wesley and said he owed him his life. Wesley responded correctly, saying, Not to me, but to the precious blood of Christ, which cleanses us from all sin. The question before us is, do you prefer swine to the value of a soul? If you do, then repent. 
see again that the Lord has placed people around you for a very specific purpose, to show his grace. And realize Jesus has given you a purpose to tell others about your Savior and his word. Don't, even, don't think others already know. Perhaps they need the encouragement or, or maybe to re, be reminded again of the value of a soul before a powerful, gracious Savior, before whom no storms of demons or sin can stand. He will save those he sets his electing love on, including you and I. Let's pray. Almighty God, our most gracious Savior, as we sometimes sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. We, we ask you that, that you would loosen our tongues, not just in the church, but with friends and families and, and give us boldness with those we rub shoulders with that we would be happy and, and take delight uh, like this former demoniac to tell everyone we know about what you have done for us. Help us to understand, even as J.C. Ryle said, never is a man in his right mind till he belongs to Christ. And may the truth of your grace motivate us to always speak uh, uh, about your sovereign transforming power we pray, Lord, that we might see more people converted and transformed by you among us and in our cities. To see people drawn to you who formerly lived for the devil, the world, and the flesh. Strengthen us to be used by you for this task and transform us to be your useful servants. We pray this in your precious name, in the name of our Savior, who valued our souls. Amen.